want to talk about ethics of litigation finance, which I think is something that's, that's been talked about a lot, um, sometimes more as a lip service than anything else, and, and hopefully we can have a somewhat more deep discussion. But before we get going, uh, I'd like to ask the panelists to just briefly introduce themselves, um, and then we'll go from there. I, I am uh, Tim Scranton. I've uh, been in this space for about 12 years. Um, I conceived and then launched uh, with a partner, uh, Juridica uh, Capital, in 2007 on the London Stock Exchange. Um, stayed in the space ever since. Uh, I was an occasional investor, advisor, um, so forth. By background, I'm a, an American lawyer. I'm also an English barrister and also admitted in a couple of other small countries. Um, and um, this is this has been my career now for over a decade. Hi, Owen Cerulnik. Uh, I am a founder and managing principal of Curium Capital. We launched about a year ago. And before that, um, I was at a plaintiff's boutique called Grace and Ellsworth, where we actually took um, litigation funding for some of our clients. So I've been on both sides of this, and we did one of the larger, sort of early-ish deals in 2010 and 2011, which got me interested in this. And before that, I was at Cravath, and before that, uh, Harvard Law School, class of 2000. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Will Mara. I'm also a graduate of the law school. I graduated from here in 2012, so it's great to be back and speaking to a lot of law students today. Um, I'm at Validity Finance, which is a litigation finance firm that just started this past summer. Uh, we're based in New York City, but we also have offices in uh, Chicago, Houston, and Denver. We're principally focused on commercial uh, litigation finance. Uh, before entering litigation finance, I was an attorney at Cooper & Kirk, which is a litigation firm in Washington, D.C. And before that, right after law school, I did a couple of clerkships, uh, first on the 11th Circuit, and then uh, on, on the Supreme Court for Justice Alito. Excellent. And for the students, because I know that we have a number of students in the room, just to kind of give a broad strokes overview, and I hope I do it justice, of, of what litigation finance is. Essentially, a third party takes part in a lawsuit the way a contingency lawyer might, um, only that rather than also then litigating and, and doing the, the attorney's work, this third party is, is unrelated to the lawsuit but for uh, funding it. And so this brings up a number of interesting ethical questions, and, and we have um, various kind of questions prepared, and we'd be interested in, in having you jump in. But kind of just to get us going, from an ethics standpoint, I'd love the speakers to kind of outline whether they think there's anything special about litigation finance, or is it just like contingency? The answer is lots. Um, there, there are lots. And I, and I, I, might, I might sort of begin by, by saying <clears throat> You know, in terms of what, what we want to talk about up here, we can talk about a number of things, but we want to try to limit it to a discussion about commercial litigation finance, that is, investing in bigger cases on kind of a one-off basis. Um, there, there is an entire field, those of you that heard the, uh, the earlier panel, that invests in personal injury claims, often through lines of credit to law firms that have personal injury cases or maybe uh, through extensions of credit or purchases of claims that claim holders have, personal injury and, and class action is a little bit probably outside of what we're going to focus on. We're looking more at the big, at buying big claims. Um, so inside of that, there, there are several silos of what I might call sort of quasi-regulation. Um, lawyer ethics is, of course, one because all of these assets uh, are being managed, <clears throat> prosecuted by, uh, by lawyers. And so legal professional ethics is, uh, is, a, is a, a marker in the harbor that you have to navigate around uh, or stay within as, as you wish. Um, there's a whole other set of legal regulations around this. Uh, some would say they're uh, moribund, if not dead. Things like Champer, do we can talk about that? Th those are things that regulate the claim holder themselves, claim holders themselves, and they can regu regulate the, the, the law firms as uh, as, as well. Um, and um, and within that, there there are just a whole lot of uh, issues that would arise that that are sort of legal professional ethical issues 
issues concerning confidentiality, how does information trade hands so that people can look at cases, and then, you know, how about the funder behavior vis-a-vis -vis, uh, vis -vis the, the claim holder? Can you control it? Uh, can you control the claim? How much can you buy? What's permissible in these kinds of things? And I thought maybe um, in, in our discussions beforehand, Will had a, had a good kind of laundry list of what the issues are, and thought I'd throw it to him and let him kind of cover Yeah, those. sure. So I'm happy to, to summarize briefly to kind of set the table, especially for those less familiar, what we talk about when we say the ethics of litigation finance. I think Tim is right that there's sort of a laundry list of different doctrines, and, and I'd like to group them for you in two general categories. I think of them sort of as gating questions. Can we do litigation finance? And then procedural questions. Assuming it's lawful in the given jurisdiction, uh, how do we do it in a proper way that complies with the law? So gating questions, and these are gonna be words and doctrines that you've heard about. Uh, Champerty and maintenance, which Tim already mentioned, so is litigation funding champertous because it is a third party financing litigation in return for a share of the fees. Usury laws are something you're gonna to wanna to think about. Is litigation funding uh, a loan with an impermissibly high interest rate? And fee sharing, there you're gonna to look to model rule 5.4, which says that lawyers cannot share legal fees with non-lawyers. So those are questions where you're gonna to wanna to ask, okay, is it legal to do litigation finance under those doctrines? And, and what we find today is in the majority of jurisdictions, litigation finance is perfectly lawful and legal and ethical. Uh, once we've checked all those boxes, then the second set of questions are these procedural questions, which are basically how do funders, lawyers, and clients, the claim holders, conduct themselves within the bounds of a, of a funding agreement. And there, too, I think we can talk about three principal doctrines. First is privilege and confidentiality, attorney-client privilege, and work product. How are we sharing information with funders so as not to waive or breach those important privileges? Um, control, are we making sure that the people who control the path of litigation are the lawyers and the clients and not the funder? And then finally is the disclosure question, is to what extent should the fact of, of funding and the details of funding be disclosed to the tribunal and to the opposing party? And I think to, to the question that was presented at the beginning, your litigation finance is certainly new, but the doctrines that we talk about are longstanding doctrines that, you know, as we learn in, in first year of law school, applying these longstanding doctrines to new, new sets of facts. Yeah, and just to add as an overlay, the, the way I think about ethics as it relates to litigation finance is, is, a, is a little bit different in the sense that what we're, what we're doing as an industry is essentially trying to provide financing to a set of businesses that for reasons mainly having to do with the topics that we're discussing, you know, things like champerty and maintenance and the perceptions of them and fee splitting has, has pretty much deprived the legal industry Maybe, maybe uniquely um, from access to capital in the way that other businesses are able to access capital. Uh, because it's very complicated to fund a law firm because you can't take a share of the profits that are coming out of that law firm. And a lot of what we're doing as an industry as we confront these topics is sort of finding ways um, to deal with some, in the modern sensibility, kind of archaic constraints on how law firms do business and how litigation is done, some of which are, are useful and important to preserving professional independence of lawyers, but some of which, as we'll see, maybe we get into some of the specifics, create kind of almost silly distinctions where you can do something one way, but if you do it another way, it's gonna violate some rule of professional conduct. Um, trying to find ways to mesh the idea of providing financing um, for the businesses of law firms with some of these overlays of rules of ethics and regulation uh, that come from, from various different avenues. And I think the, the point that Owen makes is, is a very good one and points a distinction between positive law and normative law. So we can ask, is it ethical, is it legal to do litigation finance such that we comport with the ethics laws? But I think we should all be thinking about a second question in parallel with that, which is, is it ethical in the sense of is it moral, is it just to allow people who have 
meritorious claims, but not the capital to vindicate their legal rights to receive third, third party funding. And I think that that question should ultimately inform our analysis of these specific, quote, ethics or legal doctrines. And, and to that point, I mean, the big question might be whether or not litigation funding increases access to justice. Um, and I, I think the answer seems to me at least that it can, but I wonder what it depends on. Um, and I, I don't know if you have thoughts to that piece of it. Yeah, it, it, um, I think it does. Um, um, it, or at least it, it, it provides another facility uh, for, for access to justice. Um, I can tell you that if, if there was a sort of an epiphanic moment in my creation of Juridica, it was the notion that, at least in America, contingent fee lawyers uh, could take uh, an interest in a client's case, i.e. could make an investment in the client's case, um, and could um, you know, achieve a part of the award. Um, and uh, that seemed to me to be rather lopsided, particularly taken uh, from the view where I've spent a lot of my practice in the UK, where at that time, this is 2007, uh, it was illegal for lawyers uh, to take a case on a contingent fee. And, and I'm, I'm, by using the word illegal, I mean uh, it, was, it was actually against a law. It was not against a rule of professional ethics, okay? Uh, what, why would, would they have taken such a position over there for 500 years? Well, um, the uh, judiciary of that country uh, believed that if you're going to trust um, uh, a person with an interest in these fragile uh, things, uh, claims that play out in front of the king's courts, uh, that the last person you want to trust uh, with that is a lawyer. Uh, because he's likely to do something uh, uh, wrong, maybe intentionally wrong. Uh, so that was the view, illegal over there. Uh, and in the U.S., contingent fees were, as you know, pervasive. I mean, they go back to Abraham Lincoln, um, who took chickens, I think, for, uh, for, for fees. Um, so, you know, it was that sort of, um, in a way, a paradox. I mean, we think of ourselves as the progeny of the English system, but we developed something that they considered illegal that was fundamental to the English system. Uh, so contingent fees provide access to justice, and I, I think that outside capital can improve that. Uh, the English might say better it, um, but, uh, but certainly it's an, it's an alternative. Yeah, I mean, what I would say is the contingency fee piece is an important thing to think about because there really isn't, to the first question you know, that we started with, there really isn't a huge difference in you know, sort of the policy considerations associated with control between a contingency fee um, and a litigation finance. And what, what I would say is I'm not sure that litigation finance necessarily increases access to justice. It probably does just because there's, there's more money in the aggregate, but what I think it does is it opens up choice for people who don't necessarily either have the means to or want to spend the money to finance their own litigation, it opens up more choice in who they have as their counsel because what we essentially are doing is taking a class of cases that 15 years ago could only be, you could only retain a fully contingent firm, a firm that was willing to and able to and had the aptitude for fully contingent litigation and all of the baggage that comes along with that. And now you, we, can, we can create essentially synthetically fully contingent arrangements for almost any case where a litigation funder pays the bill, but from the client's perspective, it's fully contingent. So if you have a case you wanna bring that's meritorious and has you know, enough damages to justify an investment, you can hire pretty much any lawyer you want. Um, I mean, we'd ha we've had clients from you know, the AMLA 100 law firms who are essentially trying to do this. We want to compete for a fully contingent case and we'll do it by taking litigation financing to pay our fees and from the client's perspective, they don't pay anything. And, and the last thing I'll add to that is everyone thinks about this or, or most of the time you hear about this, it's does litigation finance um, you know, sort of create the wrong set of incentives that push lawyers in the wrong direction or challenge independence. I mean, sometimes if you think about it, let's take a class action as an example or any contingency case. Um, if a lawyer is doing a case on a contingency 
the lawyer has, by definition, an inherent conflict in certain situations, like settlement situations, where the client wants to do one thing, and the lawyer may have an opinion about the likelihood of success that it wants to give the client, but also has a significant interest in getting their own fees. And maybe the law firm is under pressure because they've been doing this case on a contingency for five years, and an immediate cash infusion would be hugely beneficial to the law firm, but not necessarily the most, um, the best path for the client. That's a huge conflict that lawyers who do cases on contingency find themselves in. And to some degree, if that case were financed by a funder, you relieve the lawyer of that inherent conflict and let the lawyer give whatever advice they want to give to the client, and you sort of remove the funding an additional layer away from control. Because the client has control, the lawyer has a more direct access and influence over the client, the funder generally has no control and even less influence on the client. So in many cases, what you're doing by introducing funding instead of contingency cases is you're actually relieving some of the tension that is placed on the rules of independence and client control rather than exacerbating a problem. Yeah, I think, I think that last point in particular is a great point. And, and I'll just add an example uh, of, of for what we do at Validity. We actually work with a number of founders of companies. And I think this, th that kind of work really points to the access to justice piece is, is we have founders who come to us and say, I was screwed over by some company that I was transacting with or, or some, some, some fact pattern like that or some other company that's infringing on my IP and I don't have the capital to litigate this case. And my options right now are either to drop the case, not pursue it, mortgage my home to pursue it, or to use this litigation as an asset, this legal right that I have as an asset, and get funding from you. And so I think that's a, a kind of a real world example that for me points up how we're really bringing um, either A, a case you wouldn't, otherwise brought, or as Owen said, B, better lawyers to more fairly vindicate your rights. And I think just one final analogy is we've, medical care is a big topic today, and we've kind of increasingly come to the realization that, hey, your medical outcomes shouldn't depend on wealth. And I think the same should hold true for legal outcomes. Your legal outcomes in a case shouldn't depend on how much money you have, it should depend on how strong your legal right is. And funding, uh, I think, helps level the playing field in those, in those situations. Let me, let, me, let me throw something out there just uh, to maybe equalize the knowledge base in the audience. We're, we're talking about um, a couple of different kinds of transactions here. Um, and there are different rules depending on which transaction you're looking at. Uh, let me describe briefly the sort of core fundamental uh, client-based litigation funding transaction, okay? That is, the, that is a claim holder, could be a company, could be an individual. Uh, they have a claim they want to pursue. Um, they could find a contingent fee lawyer, and that's the end of the story. Um, if they want to go to a law firm, and this could be driven by specialization, they need a specialist. Uh, if they want to go to a law firm that doesn't offer that, or maybe it's a law firm that does offer a contingent fee, but the firm doesn't want to offer a full contingent fee, uh, the client needs money. And so what a litigation finance uh, outfit would do is effectively buy a portion of the client's claim, a thing we could debate, or the proceeds of their claim, okay, sort of a contract right, an inchoate right, um, and give the client money uh, almost always to be used to pay the lawyer, okay? Now, maybe the money is put in escrow and it's doled out to pay legal bills. Maybe it's given in a lump sum. Uh, it's rarely um, just because of potential for, uh, you know, um, perverse uh, uh, incentives. It's rarely given to the claim holder to simply walk away with and buy a yacht. Okay, so the money given to the claim holder is to pay the lawyer. There's, a, there's another transaction, or basic food group, if you will, and that is where money goes to a law firm, okay? When the money goes to the law firm to fund it in its pursuit of a client's case, 
uh, directly implicated, directly as opposed to indirectly, are rules of professional ethics, and particularly, as Will mentioned, Rule 5.4 fee splitting, which is a lawyer cannot share part of his fees with a non-lawyer, okay? So you've got two different transactions here, and we're gonna be talking about both of them, and if you can, kind of keep those straight in your head. And, and maybe on that point, and it would be interesting to see how, if you have a different answer for the two different transaction types, there's just a lot of talk about disclosure and, and how the funder should be disclosed, and we have that Senate bill um, on, on transparency. So I wonder, and, and we talked this morning about transparency being kind of key to securitizing litigation funding as an asset class. So what's, what are your thoughts on, on disclosure and, and that kind of transparency um, and, and how it relates to potentially access to justice and ethics? Yeah, well, let, let, me, uh, let me just pick up on, I'll, I'll get to that in one second, to pick up on, on the comment from a moment ago. Um, you know, the, the natural extension of that is when you look at these two different classes of transactions, you actually have two very different overlays of ethical concerns and considerations because, and this is one of the sort of maybe seemingly artificial distinctions that is important to us as an industry and points out how some of these ethics rules create implications. When you're doing a financing with the client, with the plaintiff, essentially, and you're providing financing either in one lump sum or in multiple tranches to pay legal bills, the constraints are much less significant in the sense that you pretty much from, the funders aren't constrained by legal ethics or attorney ethics rules, the clients are not constrained by attorney ethics rules, so we can pretty much make any deal we want, you know, subject to some of the other considerations like you know usury and other things like that but from a legal ethics perspective you pretty much make any arrangement we want with a client when directly financing it but when you're financing a law firm because of rule 5.4 because of the fee splitting issues you essentially run into a much larger set of problems that have to be resolved in some way and that courts and other people who are weighing in on deciding legal ethics questions are having trouble grappling with so for example most people, or at least many people in the industry, think that it's dangerous to do a single case financing with a law firm where you're taking a percentage interest in the recovery. So if a law firm, if a lawyer comes to me and says, I want to do, I want to represent this client um, in this case, and I want you to pay my fees in exchange for a percentage of my contingency fee that I'll get at the end, um, in most cases, that's a problem because it's just literally direct fee splitting. I, I, the lawyer is basically taking money from our company and agreeing to give us a percentage of the recovery they get in an individual case. And you know, it's very hard to juxtapose that with Rule 5.4 and think that you don't have a problem. So you have to do more complicated things to try to get around that, like maybe if you do a basket of cases. So there are five cases and I'll take a percentage of your recovery in all five of those cases, and they're cross-collateralized, so if you lose one, I still get paid out of the others. So maybe there, you're reducing the risk that you have a problem under Rule 5.4. But it's the sort of thing where the exact same financing from a functional perspective, depending on who the counterparty is and how you do it, can have very different legal and regulatory implications. And to the, to the point about disclosure, um, I think, at least what, what our perspective is, for the most part, I don't think that disclosure of litigation finance in most cases is that much of a problem. What, what I don't think we at least would like to see is mandatory regulatory disclosure because it feels like that's creating a, uh, an unfair disparity between the rules that apply, let's say, to plaintiffs and defendants when it comes to disclosing sources of capital. You don't ask a defendant to disclose whether they're financing their business uh, through a bank or whether they've taken investments, let's say it's a private company from a hedge fund, but you're asking a plaintiff from a mandatory perspective to disclose something about how they're financing their business or financing their case. I think that may be different when it comes to things like class actions or cases where courts take a more hands-on role in supervision or overseeing what's going on, but in an ordinary case, um, for the most part, I don't think people fear disclosure that much, except to the extent that it creates some sort of a sideshow of discovery into the financing arrangement, which derails the litigation. But I think regulating it is uh, maybe a, a bridge too far. So I think one interesting piece on the disclosure question, so initially the debate about litigation finance was should we totally ban this? Opponents would, would initially say that, and that ship never really 
left the dock. And so now we're talking about to what extent should the fact of funding and the details of funding should be disclosed. And I think disclosed one- Disclosed to the court. That's right, disclosed yeah. to the court and or the opposing court. party. And that's an important distinction because you could have in-camera disclosure to the court, uh, for example, to ensure no conflict of interest without having disclosure to the opposite party. I think one important point to keep in mind with respect to disclosure is pursuant to the discovery rules, whenever a funding agreement is actually relevant to the merits of the case, the fact of funding and the details of funding can be disclosed pursuant to a court's inherent power. That power is actually rarely utilized even though parties seek discovery of funding pursuant to Rule 26B because the fact of funding is usually not relevant to the case. And so what we're talking about are principally legislative efforts, often at the state level, but also at the federal level, to mandate disclosure even when it is not relevant within the meaning of the discovery rules. And if you think about it from the defendant's point of view, is there any information, put yourself in the shoes of the defense counsel, is there any information you would want more than to know two questions. First, does the plaintiff who is litigating against me have funding, yes or no? So you show not only the strength of those that have our financing, but also the weakness of those who don't. And then second, how much funding do they have? Okay, so I know you have $6 million worth of funding, and this case has been going on for two years, so you're probably all out of funding and you've given me a settlement offer. Well, I now have a huge informational advantage when talking about that that settlement. So I think to the extent we're, we're talking about disclosure, I think it's important to keep in mind how the fact of disclosure can affect the party's uh, litigation power. Yeah, uh, for those of you who were here for the first panel this morning, uh, there was a discussion about markets in these claims, what's necessary to build markets. The issue of transparency came up, the issue of um, information asymmetries came up. Um, what does, for those of you who heard that, um, what does this uh, discussion about transparency, openness, disclosure have to do with that? In other words, there's an issue uh, that we're speaking about, the dynamics of having to disclose the issue of funding and the pricing of funding, perhaps, to the other side. Uh, there's an another issue I could add to Will's list, and that is, does, does the, if the funding agreement is disclosed to the defendant, does that not permit a certain reverse engineering of what the likely settlement um, trigger is for the plaintiff? And if that's the case, that is the defendant is getting a notion of, of the valuation that the plaintiff has put on his own case, uh, that completely distorts the entire justice system uh, because no one would ever want to mandate uh, that uh, somebody has to tell the other side during litigation what they're gonna settle for. Uh, you might say, well, that's a good thing, but um, anyway, the, the asymmetries uh, between market disclosure and case disclosure and information flows uh, obviously are related. I mean, how can you have transparency in markets for litigation claims if you don't have transparency uh, in, in the case itself, right? In other words, you get the picture that this, this market, if you will, uh, is, is, um, is full of sort of paradoxes about who can know what, um, what information can you evaluate, what information should you be forced to uh, disclose, and so forth. And these are the issues that are being pushed in some of the state legislation that you've heard about. Another angle on, on how we could regulate this industry kind of in an effort to make it more just or more ethical or whatnot is to limit how much you can recoup, right? You can only get so and so many percent of, of the settlement. And that is kind of in, in line with the thought that the claimant probably is being rewarded for some sort of damage, right? And so should keep the bulk of the sum. How, how does that kind of regulation, that kind of thinking uh, resonate with you? Limitations? Limitations on what you Yeah, you can only, in, you know, buy 15%. Oh. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I think it, it's an interesting theory, but in, in practice, you don't always only do funding arrangements with a straight percentage of a recovery. So I think the, the concerns about the ramifications of some rule like that would be, take a situation like um, 
Will was talking about, doing funding for individuals who were sort of um, harmed in their own company. They were sort of shut out of their own company. Or let's say somebody has a claim where they think they have a $15 million claim against a former employer or a company they founded that they were shut out of um, in a freeze-out merger or something like that. Um, so the, the thing is, you may do a deal with somebody like that where there's a concern that maybe they would be willing to settle, let's say, for $2 million, uh, even though they think their claim is worth $15 million. And you do an arrangement where you take a certain percentage of their recovery, but in order to make the financing work from a modeling perspective um, and from an average return perspective, you set a floor. You say, you know, we get our, we're going to give you a $1 million dollars and we get our capital back off the top of any recovery, no matter what it is, and then we get a preferred return of, say, 30% on our capital, and then we can split the rest, um, you know, where we take 15% of anything remaining or something like that. Now, if the recovery is $15 million, that all works out fine, because the total percentage that you're going to take as the funder is actually not that high as compared to a, say, contingency case. But let's say, um, the client decides, you know what, I'm going to actually take a $3 million settlement. And then the recovery ends up being much more lopsided in favor of the funder, where the funder takes the lion's share of the recovery, or more than 50% of the recovery, because that was the business deal that was reached. If you have a regulation that says, under no circumstances can a funder ever recover X percent of a settlement, or more than X percent of a settlement, what you're going to do is you're gonna have people turning down deals like that, turning down funding arrangements like that, because there's, there's a big risk that if the settlement is less than expected, you're gonna exceed this regulation and therefore have to haircut your return in order to comply with the regulation. And I think as funders, one of the things we try hardest to do is to avoid outcomes like that anyway. Like we generally try very hard not to fund a case where we think there's a reasonable likelihood that an actual real world settlement will come in in such a way that we're taking half of the return or more than half of the return because that's not a great situation to be in. But there are situations where that's a 10% risk or a 20% risk and we will fund that case um, now without this kind of regulation. Whereas if, if there was a, a regulation that basically would force us to take less than our contractually guaranteed return in an eventuality like that, we might be much more hesitant to fund cases. And we've actually turned down you know, already cases like this, which are probably good legal claims, but where the, the risk of the outcome is high enough that we don't want to be in that situation. I think this would cause funders to, to be much more careful about funding cases like that. And I'm not sure that's an outcome that we want. Yeah, on, on this question of so for this hypothetical regulation of the hard cap, I'd like to make two points. The first is consistent with what Owen said, is I think we should be thinking about what is best practices for a funder. And so at validity, similar to what Owen was saying, we want to make sure that everyone's incentives are aligned. We don't want to invest in a case where the expected outcome for the client is going to be less than at least 60%. Because we want the client, we want the lawyer, and we want ourselves both to have financial skin in the game, but also to have an upside. And then the second point that I'd like to just briefly make is, is a point about innovation and caution as we think about what types of regulations we should put in. I think over the past 20 years especially, we've seen enormous innovations in the medical industry with respect to uh, care for the environment, technology, but we haven't really seen that in the legal industry. And I think a big reason for that are a lot of the ethical rules that we're talking about that essentially give us, here in the room, lawyers, a monopoly on legal profits. And as a consequence, we don't have a lot of people coming in and really innovating. And in law school, for the, for the law students here, we're really encouraged and taught to innovate about legal doctrines and, and how should we be changing the legal doctrines to ensure access to justice. And we should be doing that, but we should also realize that there's an economic component to the law and we should be thinking about how can we innovate different sorts of economic arrangements that increase access to justice. And my concern with the sort of regulations that are being proposed, for example, a rate cap is we're going to stifle the innovation that, uh, you know, like Owen was saying, you might have sort of case-by-case -case situations that wouldn't fit within this package but might otherwise be good for, for clients. Perhaps more um, 
uh, uh, well, on an elevated level, some of what you're hearing uh, is, is relating to the structure, the nature and structure of these deals. Um, I, I can tell you that we can have a spirited debate over whether when an investor invests in litigation, is it debt, is it equity, is it a combination? What, what, what are your thoughts quickly on that? I think it depends. I mean, we, we don't do, at Curium, we don't do the sort of forward purchase specifically designed to look like equity deals that I think some other funders um, do. And, you know, we, we do, we actually do uh, real debt deals where we fund mass tort portfolios of 20,000 cases for a law firm where it's really just a straight loan with a real credit agreement and a set interest rate. And then we do more hybrid single case fundings where we do, it's essentially a funding agreement. We provide a certain amount of money in exchange for a set return. I, I think you can have a debate about whether it's debt or equity. I'm not sure the distinction is that important in this context because maybe it matters from a tax perspective. In certain cases, maybe it doesn't. I think our lawyers would say it doesn't matter because you're still stuck with the tax treatment as if it was as if it was debt anyway. So I don't really focus that much on the, the label. I, I think from a functional perspective, it doesn't really matter all that much. And I think it can go either way. Yeah. Thoughts? Hey, I, I, yeah, I have a similar view. I think one, one, issue, one place where this comes up in the law is on usury laws. So the, almost all jurisdictions don't apply the usury laws to uh, litigation funding agreements. And the reason is because usury laws only apply to loans that have an absolute obligation to uh, repay. And because funding agreements are contingent upon the outcome of a case, litigation funding agreements are not subject to the use of the law. So I think that's at, at least one area where at least that specific type of loan is not a, a litigation funding agreement. Yeah. I'll use a term that's common in the industry. I, I, I thought it was the wrong term for a long time, and then I looked it up again, and I, I think I was wrong. Uh, non-recourse. Um, I always thought it should be limited recourse, but in fact, in Black's Law Dictionary, uh, non-recourse is um, is defined as um, a, a a transaction uh, where the uh, counterparty has recourse only to a single asset. All right. So, in these transactions, what makes them unique, which what makes them expensive. Uh, is that the investor is typically only looking to a single asset or a couple of assets that are cases. And so if those fail, there's no recourse to the law firm or to the company, uh, whoever the trading partner is, uh, but only recourse to the, to, to the outcome of that. Now, I, I'll, I'll throw out one other thing that raises issues uh, sort of beyond the 15% issue, and that is, I mean, should... Uh, should funders be able to structure uh, these investments with, uh, with preferred returns? Um, so consider this. Um, um, a company puts up $5 million for a litigation. It's being used for legal fees. And the deal that is struck is that the client has to uh, give the funder the first $5 million that's recovered. So if it's a train wreck and only five million is recovered on a hundred million dollar claim, the funder would be happy, the client would be unhappy, the lawyer, if they were on a pure fee basis, would be paid, all right? So what if the pref, so to speak, uh, goes to from one X, that is the invested capital, to two X? What if the funder gets the first two X or the first 10 million dollars if they put out five million? I mean, are these things fair? And they, you can see how they start to really outstrip the issue of the per, pure percentage uh, because they, they have to do with, uh, you know, kind of the fundamental justice involved in the, you know, in the transaction. Now, I'm not accusing any funders of doing that, but I think you'd all agree it's pretty common uh, yeah, for I, this kind of price capital to want a preferred return. And I'll say um, I, I think there, there are good and valid questions about whether post facto an arrangement like that is fair or should be set aside or should be regulated. But I will say that there are enormous incentives for funders who are thoughtful and know what they're doing to avoid situations like this. So, and, and the main reason is even if you set aside fairness and morality, 
and future, bus future business issues, just think about it from a purely self-interested perspective. In a situation like that, the client is gonna have very little incentive to settle for $5 million if I'm getting the full $5 million. The client, let's say the client agrees that the true discounted value of the case given the risk at a moment in time is $4 million and the defendant offers $5 million. So if the plaintiff is being economically rational in the ordinary case, they would say, sure, I'll take the five million. But if they know the five million is gonna make the funder whole, but they're gonna get zero dollars out of that, a rational client would say, you know what, I'm gonna roll the dice and probably lose, and I'm basically throwing good money after bad because I could have gotten, let's say, 80% of the five million, but instead I'm trying to take 100% of the five million and I'm getting zero and we lose the case, or 50% of the five million, whatever the number is. So, there is an enormous self-interested incentive for funders not to structure agreements to create a situation like, like this kind of nightmare scenario. And not only is there a, an ex-ante incentive for a funder to do that, but what often happens in situations like this when it occurs, and inevitably it will occur once, once in a while, is to have a discussion with the client and say, with the claimant and say, look, claim and says, I want to settle for five million, I think it's a good deal, but I'm going to get nothing out of it and you're going to get five million, I can't do that. That's not in my, not, I'm not fulfilling my fiduciary duty, duty to my board, to my shareholders, whatever, um, to my stakeholders. Can we make a deal to modify this arrangement? And most funders would say, sure, you know, I think you should take the five million dollar deal and why don't we just agree to modify the waterfall so that you get something and we get something and we take a deal that we think is in the best interest of the enterprise. The only thing I'll quickly add to, to those thoughts is one question we should be asking ourselves is do we think there's a difference in our answer depending on whether we're in a commercial litigation funding scenario or a consumer litigation funding scenario. There's a whole bunch of areas of, of financial law and commercial law where we distinguish between commercial and consumer and particularly where you have these very sophisticated parties with sophisticated counsel contracting, do we think that some of these concerns are, are a little bit less strong because people sort of know uh, and are making rational ex ante uh, decisions where we might be more suspect of that in the consumer context? I think this might be a good point to, to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, I think there's a hand there. JP, do you mind running the mic? Uh, I think there was a hand right there. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, to each of you for coming and delivering this talk. Um, I have two questions. The first regards the imposition of fiduciary duty to litigation funders. Now, um, obviously, it doesn't make much sense for funders to be deemed fiduciaries in uh, commercial cases, but what do you think of, say, consumer cases or even consumer class actions? Let's take a, an, an asbestos class action, for instance, uh, where, it's n where it's not the kind of class action where class members don't have high value claims or they don't have much skin in the game. Um, and then couple that with the, some funding agreements where, that we've seen where funders exercise um, control over the course of litigation generally and also retain powers over settlement in the course of settlement. In those kinds of situations, so the kind of situation, um, so say a class action or some other kind of consumer um, case where the claimant seems to be particularly vulnerable, um, do you think that there may be scope for the imposition of fiduciary duties uh, generally? I'm talking obviously about a fact-based fiduciary relationship, not, um, uh, I'm not insinuating that litigation funders uh, as an office or, or at some kind of general level should be considered fiduciaries. Um, and my, my second question, sorry, uh, pertains to class action. So, uh, the possibility of uh, funders moving into a class action space has been addressed. Now, I have a question that goes to how, how would that work on a granular level? What would 
that kind of arrangement look like? Would there be a, an, an agreement between the funder and the lawyer, where the funder pays the lawyer's fees at a lodestar basis? Um, would the funder be contracting with the class representative? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just quite curious that if litigation funding were to move into class actions, how would the funding agreements be structured and who would they involve? Thanks. That was two questions, not three. Pick the one you like the best. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I'll take the fiduciary uh, issue. Um, I, you know, outside of um, the consumer space, which is the space we, we are in, we're outside of it, um, I, don't, I don't think there's any need or use for imposing special duties on funders. Um, I mean, we're talking about B2B claims. We're talking about sophisticated lawyers being involved. Um, now, uh, on the consumer side, should there be fiduciary duties? Um, I, I think that would complicate the law significantly. Um, I, I, I don't know where such duties exist uh, in banking, payday lending, or anything else. Um, obviously, lawyers owe fiduciary duties. And, and I could agree with you at the most fundamental level, looking at the lawyer, not the, fund, not the funder. Uh, con, con, consider my basic uh, example. Um, lawyer has a client that needs money. Lawyer wants client to have money. Lawyer finds a funder. Funder gives money to client to pay lawyer. What has the lawyer just done? The lawyer has just transacted in his client's asset, his claim, to produce money to pay the lawyer, okay? Now, is that a breach of the lawyer's fiduciary duty to the client to engage in such conduct? No. Um, are there disclosure requirements? Yes. Um, you know, could, could there be some kind of uh, a fiduciary issue there? The courts haven't seen it yet, but it will probably come. Okay, so on the lawyer side, certainly there are fiduciary duties. I don't think there's any scope in commercial litigation funding for any fiduciary duties or really in, in, uh, in the consumer side. Real quickly on class actions, um, uh, Selvin Seidel, who you heard from earlier, I remember a, a meeting that we had in New York in 2008 um, or nine. They had just launched Burford, we had Juridica. And we, we had, a little, um, had a little evening uh, discussion over whether we should eschew any funding of class actions. Why did we do this? Well, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce had just come out, uh, published a huge report saying litigation funding is evil. Uh, they were literally, uh, and if there's a chamber member in the audience, I'm happy to show you the transcripts. Uh, they were planning to, um, you know, run short uh, shorts at the beginning of films in major movie houses about how litigation funding was terrible. And uh, against that uh, fear, um, we considered taking a policy statement, we will not fund class actions. And uh, Selvin was against it, I think I was kind of against it. Um, but, but the point is this, what did history teach us? Well, history taught us that funding a class action is almost a fool's errand anyway. Um, why? Because there's not a plaintiff to deal with. There's no person to transact with. Um, the only person that you could transact with is a lawyer, right? So you could loan money to the law firm. You could do some kind of a structured deal, as Owen was describing, uh, where the law firm you know, has a basket of claims or what have you, and you make some kind of capital advance to the law firm. But basically, it's hard to fund a class action. And, and if you do fund a class action, you're faced with court supervision of all fees paid out of the class. You know, it's very, a lot of grown-up supervision. Okay, so hard to get the kinds of returns that litigation funders expect in the marketplace. You cannot get three, four, five X on your money. And I can tell you when the DiNapoli firm tried to do that in the World Trade Center cleanup litigation about six years ago, the judge cut the funder down uh, to, to a very modest uh, interest level. So it's not really a danger. It's kind of a red herring, I, I guess. Yeah, I'll just add to that, I think, I completely agree in the current landscape and regulation framework, funding class actions is really hard. I think it's probably, aspirationally, it's probably good, both for the legal system and for funders, to be able to develop the ability to do this. I think the way to do it is 
to sort of have a legal framework that says that it's accepted or maybe even preferred and to have when you're applying for lead counsel to be able to say I'm not doing this on a contingency but I have this funder attached and the economics of my proposal are better than the contingency fee being offered by my competitor and here's a disclosure of the proposed financing to the court and the court blesses it in advance and when they appoint that firm as lead counsel and says okay I'm picking you I like the economics you're providing to the class I accept this proposal and sort of advan prove it in advance not to be haircut down the road. I think that's a framework that could work and probably is, is, a, is to the good for everybody, but not, it's, not, it's not in place right now to do that. 